And that, I think, is very positive because although, of course, I believe in foreign corresponding, I'm a foreign correspondent, I would. But in the end, I think that the stories people tell in their own societies and I think that the journalism which is done to bring your own government to account is the most important thing. To the Harbour Grace excursion with the boys to have. It's really saved my life. For those who haven't had the uh, privilege yet of reading this, tell us a little bit about Marie. What made her so special? Well, I think what made her so special was, and you saw some of it in the film, this combination of um, this sense of humor and her bravery and her determination. I mean, she would always go in further and stay longer. There's a lot of us who do this job, you included, who go to dodgy places and cover wars. But Marie was special because of that and because of the relationships that, that she formed over, over a long time. And I was, I suppose, in her outer circle of friends. If I'd been in her inner circle, I don't think I could have written the book, but I was in her outer circle, and, and I, I like to think of us as the Thelma and Louise of the press corps, <laughs> right? Um, but she, she formed very strong relationships with very powerful men, Yasser Arafat, Muammar Gaddafi. But you know, the people who really mattered to her were the women who she met in her last assignment in Babarama, in Homs, in Syria, in the widow's basement, who were being, these were the women who, and the children who were being bombarded by Bashar al-Assad's artillery. They mattered to her more than the important people that she met. So it was that kind of combination, I think, which, which was what made her so special. And we're going to get to the issue of her relationships with some of these powerful mm. dictators, which is so fascinating. But before that we get there, you mentioned that if you'd been in the inner circle, it would have been more difficult mm. to write this. For those of you who've read this, you must agree that it's, it's so incredibly detailed. I've never read a biography of somebody that's mm. not an autobiography that has this level of detail. How did you get that? Well, was, that, it, yeah. was there any time you were a bit uncomfortable about that almost? Well, look, this is, it's a very strange thing to get to know your friend better in death than in life. Yeah. But that's what happened because I, when I decided I wanted to write her, her biography, I found that she had kept these journals. So these were notebooks, and some of them are like ordinary notebooks, like the kind of notebooks I would keep or you would keep, you know, when you're interviewing people. But then there was all this very intimate personal stuff in there as well. Because all the way through her life, she, she recorded what she was feeling and thinking as well. So this was what really... Um, what meant that I could get to know her so well. I interviewed lots of people, her family, her friends, and so on. Let, let me take you back, let me take to, to why did I decide to, to yeah. write this. So in basically 2012, in February, the uprising in Syria was turning into civil war, and I was in Beirut, a lot of us were in Beirut, and I went for dinner with Marie and with Jim Muir of the BBC and Neil McFarker of the New York, New York Times. And it was, all the talk was about, are we going to get smuggled into Syria, into Babar Amar, this besieged suburb? And three of us said, this is beyond our danger threshold. We're not going to do this. And Marie said, anyway, it's what we do. <laughs> so that was what she did. So she and her photographer, Paul Conroy, got smuggled in. Getting smuggled in meant being handed from person to person. It meant crawling through a storm drain, which is like a sewer, like bent double like this for more than a kilometer. And it meant entering hell, a hell where the bombardment was every few seconds the rockets came in. So she went in, she did her story. She had to leave because the rebels said they had to leave. And then she went back again. She went back again because she felt that she'd been abandoning the people by leaving. And I found out she was there, and I called, because you could call on Skype. I wanted to interview her for my program, but also, I mean, I was, I was furious with her. Yeah. So I, I said, why, why did you go back in? She said, Lindsay, it's the worst we've ever seen. I said, I know, but you know, what's your exit strategy? She said, that's just it, we don't have one, I'm working on it now. And a few hours later, she was killed. So that stayed with me. 
Yeah. That she haunted me. I couldn't for about a year. I couldn't go anywhere dangerous. I just, I just couldn't do it. And, and then eventually. Well, okay, then there's another story, which is how I came to write it, which was, so I went, so about a year later or so, I did start to go back to Syria. I went to Aleppo, and um, I injured my knee. I tore a ligament in my knee, and I would like to tell you that I did this through saving a child. <laughs> However, <laughs> oh the truth God. of the matter is that there's this guy who was selling <laughs> soap and spices in his shop very near the front line. And I thought, oh my God, that's amazing. Let me support him. So let me buy some soap. And I fell down the stairs as I was trying to get up to his shop and buy the soap. So I went to the heart of the war zone and came back with a shopping injury. Was there a child, though, at the bottom of the stairs that no, you were trying to there help? No, that was just okay, me. Just, okay. Anyway, so then I came back to London, and I'm forced, you know, <laughs> lying on the sofa in my kitchen with my leg up, feeling sorry for myself, thinking, what am I going to do with my useless life? <laughs> and thinking, you know, I want to write another book, what I want to write. And then I realized that what I had to write was Marie's biography, because I thought, I want to write about one person in the places that I've been. I thought, Lindsay, this is obvious, and you've been running from it. You have mm. to write Marie's biography. And so that was, that was what I did. But how did it feel when you were reading those, those diaries? I mean, so often we write diaries <laughs> just for yourself, and you're getting into the, de uh, the, you know, the, the really what was going on in her head. OK, so for me, the most, so there were, as I said, 300 diaries and notebooks, which I went through over the course of a year. And then I went to Long Island, which is where Marie was brought up. Marie was the eldest of five children in this very Catholic family. Her parents were school teachers. They were pretty kind of middle class, and you know they were they were not um, you know they were not fancy people. And uh, her mother uh, very kindly let me take away these boxes of papers, which were in the basement. And I got back to where I was staying on Long Island, and I found this plastic covered diary, like a child's diary, which was locked with a tiny key. <laughs> so I'm looking for the key, and I can't find the key. So eventually, I slit it open, and I look in it. Oh my god, this is Marie's diary from when she's 13. That's amazing. And I must be the first person who looked at it since she locked it, maybe at the age of 14. <laughs> and most of the diary, OK, most of the diary is about who went, who sat next to whom on the school bus. And which boy smiled at which girl, <laughs> right? And a boy called Jeff, who didn't look at her at all. And then I got to my favorite entry, right? Mm. So my favorite entry is very short. It says, to church, war mini, the mother and the father no like. <laughs> and I thought, oh, yes, I know the brave the brave, rebellious woman that naughty girl grew right. into. Right. And so from her diaries from a very early age, she's, and then another, there was another one. Marie had a very interesting combination of things that I realized later. So as a child and as a teenager, um, she was extremely rebellious. I mean, she used, there was a tree, her mother still lives in the same house where she was brought up, and the, outside Marie's first floor bedroom, there's a tree which she used to climb down to when she was like 15 to go up the road to have sex with a guy called Chris. Okay, so that's what she did. So she was very, and they used to go, they used to break into people's gardens and go skinny dipping in their pools at night. I mean, she was really naughty. And then Chris <laughs> said to me, he said, but you know, when she was, when we weren't doing that stuff, whenever I turn around, she was reading her school books because she was very diligent and she was an A student. So there she is, she's rebellious, but she's very diligent. But then she had this immense social conscience. So there's a point where I find out from another boyfriend that she got, there was this nun who she used to hang out with and they were, there was the miracle of Mrs. Smith's pies. So Mrs. Smith um, made pies and some of them, the, there was a whole batch where the crust was burnt and so they gave them out to the poor. Right. So there's Marie, you know, <laughs> schlepping all these pies around, you know, any flavor you want as long as it's coconut custard um, and all of this. And then Marie gets involved in ecology and she gets very excited right. and she tells everybody to bring their stuff to their 
house and she's going to recycle it. She didn't tell her parents, needless to say. Suddenly everybody's bringing junk to our yard. <laughs> so these three things, the rebellion, right. diligence, and social conscience, that's what you need that's... to be as a journalist, right? And I could see this from very early in her life. When we were talking before um, tonight, you had said that you did have some angst, though, about some of the entries later. She had some very traumatic relationships, and you yeah. worried as well, as we do, you know, how much do you play up as a female correspondent? Am I treating this differently because she's a woman? Yeah. Look, I I'm glad you included it because it was just, it made her so human and um, it really brought her to life. But I can understand how you would have that angst. Yeah, look, so Marie, Marie married twice, although actually her, she, used, she and her first husband, they got together, then they divorced, then they got back together, and they always used to tell everybody that they had remarried. I thought that she had married Patrick twice. <laughs> and then when I interviewed him, he said, nah, nah, we just used to tell everybody we'd married again. <laughs> and basically it was a good story, right? But, so there was that. But Marie, I mean, there's a lot of women in the audience, so I think you know, you know the kind of guy who's incredibly exciting and fun and has a sign over his, set, his head saying, date but do not marry. <laughs> Rita, she always married him, you know? So that was it. But I mean, part of that is about, I call the book an extremist because that was something about something she, she wrote. She said, I write about people living in extremists, enduring the unendurable in war. But she lived her whole life in extremists. And so her professional and her personal life was all wound up together. And yes, I did worry because I mean, I think we've all read, you know, those biographies of great men, which say on page, you know, on page 76, it says, by this time, Horace had married his childhood sweetheart, Mary, who right. bore him three children. And then on page 224, <laughs> right. it says, by this time, Horace had divorced Mary and married his secretary, Susan, who bore him, you know, three children or whatever. You know, and that's kind of it. And so I worried, was I falling into a trap? Oh, but the diaries were irresistible. And because she is one of the best writers about heartbreak who I've ever come across. Absolutely. You know, when she's writing about the travails of I these think that's relationships. that's what I love, that she became so, you really, really mm. were drawn to her by those entries and what she would say. And you had one great line uh, about one of her, I guess this was with Patrick, and she was in the end of the bad relationship at that time, and you wrote, salvation of a kind came from an unexpected quarter, Saddam Hussein. Yes, <laughs> was was phew, like, <laughs> he invaded Kuwait. Thank so God. Could, thank God, 1991, he invaded Kuwait, she can get away from Patrick and go and right. cover a war. <laughs> Phew. Yeah, but I think that, like, that's what makes it so. I think that was all. Let me read you. An, I want to read. Can I read another <clears throat> of course. bit? Which I, and this is a bit. This sort of jumping forward. This is 1999 when she's in Chechnya. And so what happened was this is the war in Chechnya at the end of 1999, December. And the rest of us. I was in Ingushetia talking to refugees, um, which was kind of reasonably safe. And so, um, but no, Marie was not going to do that. Marie went in with the rebels across the Caucasus from Georgia, which is incredibly dangerous. So she's being bombed by the Russians the whole time. There comes a point where their car is bombed and she's lying in a field thinking she's going to be killed while the, you know, the MiG is overhead just, you know, the whole time circling them and they're lying there pretending they don't exist. And she's there with um, Dima Belyakov, who a, a, was a very young Russian photographer. And then... The road back to Georgia was cut by Russian bombing, so they could not go back. They couldn't drive back out. And so they had to walk over the Caucasus Mountains. This is, we're talking in the middle of winter. And then, and this, it's a whole long story, and Marie's diary at this point, her notebook, is in tiny, tiny writing. So she's obviously worried she's gonna run out of pages. <laughs> Right, it's very neat writing. Sometimes her writing, I, I got to know her drunken writing and all that. This is very, very tidy little writing. So she, she obviously thinks she might die, and this is what yeah. will be. This will be the record that she will leave. Anyway, eventually they they get to a sort of shepherd's hut, just on the Georgian side of the border, but they're still not safe. Nobody knows where they are, and there are these entries, and it's it's Christmas Eve, right? And so she, they're in a shepherd's hut. Irony is not lost on her. <laughs> and you see, there's the sort of Girl Scout bit of Marie, and she writes this. 24th of December, 1999. How bad is situation? Can we survive, co can survive go cold and environment in house? Don't think we would have lasted otherwise. 
Water, plenty. Snow and river three to four kilometers away, probably not worth the walk, calories used. Food, problem, down to <laughs> bread ends. If that sawdust stuff is flour, mixed with water and cook, desperate enough. Bucket of onions and garlic, moldy. Murad, this was the Chechen guy they were with. Murad has pistol, animals, small things. Morad found bag of nails, were able to fix plastic sheets. Look for red berries, mistake to let fire go out, cold seeps in, things they never tell you, constant battle to keep fire going. So that's the sort of Girl Scout bit of Marie. And then in the same entry, should be in Paris cooking Christmas dinner. Snowstorm closes in midday, obscuring the mountains in a haze starting on the small, gentle white flakes, then cloud of white. Dima, that's the photographer, thinks of writing a letter to his wife. I'm not worried we won't survive, just how long we have to be here and the worry I will cause those who care. Does make me think, who cares? Mom, if she knows, will have a terrible Christmas. Patrick, that's the husband who she's now back with, will be worried and furious. I can't tell what he will feel. I think he does love me. But it's a love where he wants his own life and me to fit into it, hard to describe even to myself, because he doesn't want me around all the time, more knowing I'm there and the comfort of time together. I think, oh my God, at this point, this sort of breaks my heart, because yeah. at this point, she's any woman worrying about whether her man really loves her or not, and there she is in the mountains of Chechnya and Georgia in the snow up to here, not really knowing if she's going to make it. That's what, that's what I mean by making her so human in that, in the many entries she has about worrying about her, her weight. And you had, you had said that uh, you didn't want this book to contribute to the myth of Marie. And I think all, including all of that doesn't. Mm. But what did you mean by that? What was that? Was that well, what word? I mean is after, because of the tragic nature of Marie's death, um, there's a sort of, um, and because you know, it was very significant in terms of Syria that she was killed at this point where, you know, as I said, the war was turning from uprising to, to civil war. And, um, and she was trying to tell the, you know, the story of Syrians. And so she became a bit of a sort of patron saint, as it were. And if there's something Marie wasn't, it's a saint. You know, yeah. she was so not a saint. Yeah. And then there was a movie, and then um, Paul Conroy, her photographer, wrote a book, and that was turned into a, a, a film, which was um, a documentary film, which was very good. And she's sort of become this byword for this brave, glamorous female war correspondent. And look, by writing the biography, of course I've contributed to the myth, but I think that her story is cautionary as well as exemplary. Because Marie did not ca take care of her mind or her body. And she was, she was very determined and she was a brilliant journalist. But she drank too much and she she was at times reckless yeah. and you know I, I worry sometimes young people who want to be journalists particularly want to be correspondents come talk to me and say oh she was so amazing and I'm saying yeah she was brilliant you know emulate the good things but also you know learn some of the lessons as well yeah. and I, I want to get to that where journalism is heading and, and what mm. the future is for foreign correspondents and I apologize we're jumping all over the place but we were joking on the way up here that we just wanted to bring our drinks because we just actually were hoping none of you would be we're here. We're channeling Marie. We just, <laughs> we just met tonight and we're like oh can well, I tell this you is so annoying these people are here. Can Can't I tell we just you this story? Talk? Can I tell you the story? Yes. So there was an occasion when Marie and I were on Marie and I were on a platform. This is so politically incorrect. I hope Anthony Feinstein isn't here. Um, so we, we were on a platform talking to some women, many was women, um, who were involved in amnesty in the UK. And an earnest young woman gets up and asks the, the question, which is, you know, how do you cope with the trauma? And I look at Marie, and we're like, you know, it's a Thursday night. You want me to tell you how I cope with the trauma? Um, so I look at Marie, and Marie, Marie says, Lindsay and I, we go to bars and we drink. Um, <laughs> <laughs> had the virtue. He sat of down. True. So that was <laughs> had the virtue of being true. <laughs> Before we get to the um, her relationships with some of these powerful men and the future of uh, what's happening with foreign correspondents. Yeah. Let's just revisit that night that you went out for dinner, when you said that you, you mentioned that. Everybody had said, this is yes. too risky yeah. to go. You yourself decided not yeah, to go. Sure. 
Um, was that, Marie seemed to be, sure, she was extreme and she pushed it and yeah. she said she went places others didn't and she stayed longer. Did you ever worry there was a sense of hubris at that point though or she just, I mean obviously knowing what happened, yeah. but there was, she wasn't making the risk return ratio decision yeah. that most journalists should be Absolutely. making. Absolutely. And I think look, that part, and, and she pushed herself more and more and I think that some of that came from, um, came from early success because you know, as a journalist, you don't, on the whole, you know, we have this phrase, you know, making a difference. On the whole, we don't. We just go and we do our stories, and it doesn't make a difference. Um, I think it's important. It's important that people should know. Knowledge is always better than ignorance. But Marie, I think, really did believe in making a difference. And I think that that came from two incidents. One came from very early in her career when she was in Beirut in 1987, and there was... It was in the, the war in Lebanon. It was a war within a war. Um, and she got into one of the, into a, a Palestinian refugee camp which was besieged by Amal, a militia which was sponsored by Hafez al-Assad, the father of the current Syrian president. And she, I mean, this again, this was already danger, which I wouldn't do. She and Tom Soddard, who was a photographer she was with, they bribed an Amal commander to get his men to cease fire for one minute and during that one minute, they would run into the camp. And they held and they, hands. They held yeah. hands as they ran. And, and they, they held hands yeah. as they ran across this ground. So the other and then person 20, could drag the... Yeah, other and one. then 24 hours later, the agreement was that this, he would cease fire again so they could run out. Oh, my God. Yeah. But this was a story which was... There was a, it was very famous in Britain because there was a British nurse, um, a Scottish nurse called Susie White and a, um, a British doctor, uh, Pauline Cutting, who were in there, and they were like sort of sending messages out on radio phone or something about you know, how people were dying and eating rats. And young women would leave the camp to go and get food, and they would run up what was called the path of death because the snipers were around. Right. And Marie saw one of those young women being killed. And when that, and it was the first time she'd seen death in that way. And when she got and the young woman was taken to the hospital and they tried to cure her and she noticed that the young woman was wearing these little gold earrings and she wrote about that. In fact, I'm just going to read it because I think it was so significant. It was so significant in her, in her life. And she, though her hair was clotted with blood, Haji Ahmed Ali seemed younger now that she had been cleaned. Her body was soft and shapely. She wore two tiny gold earrings. Someone opened her fist and cleaned out the handful of blood-soaked dirt that she had clenched in her pain. Now, that story had an impact. It was a time when Gorbachev was in power in Russia. He was like, the Russians were the, the sponsors of Hafez al-Assad. In those days, the Sunday Times was a very important newspaper, and they splashed this on the front page, the war against women. The Americans put pressure on Gorbachev, Gorbachev put pressure on Hafez al-Assad. The siege was lifted. And I think, you know, the 24 hours she spent in Borja Abarajni had a huge effect on Marie. The image of the young woman lying on the path, her lifeblood seeping into the dirt, never left her. Haji Ahmad Ali had reminded her of Kat. The earrings she had noticed were similar to a pair she had given her younger sister. Years later, she would talk about that day in the camp and about the horror and fear she saw amongst the Palestinians there. She was proud of her story, believing it had made a difference. As a Sunday newspaper journalist, she had the time to get right into the middle of whatever situation she was reporting on, a variation on the famous war photographer Robert Kappa's maxim, if your pictures aren't good enough, you're not close enough. Other journalists might remain at the margins, filing from relative safety, but not Marie. She would get up close. She would not write about herself, but her journalism would be distinguished by the intensity of her personal experience. And so I think, yeah. yes, I think there was hubris by the end, and that, I think, is where it began. Well, that would be addictive, though, at a young age and the start of your career, yeah. you actually made a difference. And she did have another very significant story when she was in East Timor Well, this is East well. Timor. So East Timor, and in fact, it is the 20th anniversary of, the, um, of what happened in East Timor, the independence referendum, where they voted for independence, and the... Um, the Indonesians would, who you know, were the colonial power would not accept the results and sponsored these hideous militia with machetes 
who went around terrorizing people. And um, a lot of East Timorese fled into the UN compound, and Marie ended up in the UN compound as well. And in fact, there's a, there's a one, this is a Marie story. Um, there's a, so it was very dangerous, and most editors withdrew all of their um, journalists. Marie being Marie did not ring her foreign editor to ask for permission to stay, she just stayed. That was Marie. And then she rang him and she said, Sean, I'm staying in the compound and there's two other journalists, Minka and Irina, who are here as well, um, who said all the others have left. And so Sean goes, so they're both women too? She goes, yeah, yeah. And he said, so where, the men have all gone? She says, yeah, she says, I guess they don't make men like they used to. <laughs> <laughs> Such a Marie comment, it's so unfair because I happen to know there were two male journalists who'd gone into the mountains with the gorillas, which was just as dangerous, but anyway, <laughs> far a bit for Marie. But by staying, and she did a lot of broadcasting, not just writing, it put huge pressure on the UN not to pull out, which it was threatening to do, and on international governments. And in fact, within a few days, the Indonesians had backed, the, the UN had decided to stay, the Indonesians had backed down, the Australians were sending in a peacekeeping force, and she felt that that was really a high point, and that her presence and her journalism had saved people's lives. So, yeah, that's addictive. Absolutely, and I, I think, I just want to talk briefly about her relationships with Arafat and Gaddafi, because they are some of the most compelling parts mm. of the book, but a different part of journalism. I don't think yeah. her relationships necessarily with them and the stories she broke, she had a lot of exclusives, but yeah. they probably weren't changing the course of history. But they were fascinating. I mean, they both were very intrigued by her. Just, yeah. and different yeah, relationships, so, you but know, explain again, So this is sort of the, the Reagan bombing of uh, Tripoli in 1982, that was when she first got an interview with Gaddafi, who was kind of creepy and predatory and all of this sort of stuff. And Marie loved clothes. She always loved clothes, so he was fantastic. You know, his <laughs> golden cape and his lizard skin slippers and all of this kind of stuff. And there was one occasion, actually, he was very creepy, when he put a pair of, he was obsessed with green. This is not Gaddafi green, this is different green. Um, <laughs> this lady there in Gaddafi it's, it's green. It's a totally different um, paint chip. Um, yeah. But he put <laughs> these little slippers outside the room and wanted her to put them on. Wasn't before there a dress the as well that he and wanted a dress to wear? And so on. Yeah. She was like, no, it's all too small for me. Yeah. I mean, but he was very intrigued by her, but she was always like cat and mouse right. with him. And with Arafat, the reason she got to know Arafat so well was because she... Now, Arafat was teetotal and didn't smoke. But all of his aides drank a lot and smoked a lot. And Marie had an insatiable appetite for whiskey and cigarettes. She could drink whiskey and smoke cigarettes till the early hours of the morning. And Arafat would only see journalists at like 3 o'clock in the morning. Everybody else had given up and gone back to the hotel. <laughs> but Marie still smoking and drinking with Bassam Abu Sharif or any other of Arafat's aides. She was always there. So Arafat would say... Okay, tell Mary she can come. Both Gaddafi and Arafat always called her Mary. They never got Marie. I love that they never got her name right. They never right. got her name right. But over 25 <laughs> years, he, she did lots of interviews with him. And she was challenging in those interviews. There was a, a particular occasion when she was challenging him on whether he supported terrorism. And she could hear that his, you know, his bodyguards cocking their weapons. You know, and the boss was very angry with her. But... In the end, he, you know, he would always forgive her. And she became quite close to his wife, Suha. Mm -hmm. And in fact, one of the best things, she treated them as individuals, as men. She wasn't in awe of people. And I think that they liked that. But I always like one of the stories about Suha, because Arafat, you may remember, married a much younger woman, a Christian woman. And um, she liked, you know, sort of a bit of the high life and so on. And she and Marie would, you know, go out together, go to cocktail parties in Tunis together and so on. And, you know, and Suha complained, you know, oh, you know, Yasa, he always says I take too long getting ready. He says I have, he calls me Imelda. He says I have too many shoes. So there's not a woman in the Western world whose husband hasn't called her Imelda Marcos of that era. Even Yasa Arafat's wife, you know. But that was the kind of thing Marie picked up. But there had been some criticism, and perhaps this was born of yeah. jealousy, but some would say she, she, her relationships too were too close. Yeah, there certainly were some who said that. Do you but think some it ever her, was? Like, do you think it ever affected her stories in a way that... Well, I mean, her, she spent a lot of time in Israel, and she had very good relations there, and she got on very well with Yitzhak Rabin right. against smoking. 
right. because you know he was very kind of edgy in an interview and she said you know why are you so edgy and he's like i need a cigarette and marie said so do i and so you know and so that was how they got I, along i really so feel well. like being a non-smoker really I said, it's, me it's back blighted a, my yeah, career me too yeah the non-smoking bit has absolutely <laughs> blighted my career yeah <laughs> i have all time only for one more question then we're going to open it up but um, I'd like to end with talking about where journalism is going, especially yeah. this type of journalism, because it has changed so very much. And, mm. and I know even in the course of my career, when I was covering terrorism, it was, we talked about this before, I was always surprised at how, I mean, I've interviewed three people on yeah. the UN terrorism watch list. Uh, you know, fundamental uh, yeah. Islamic militants would agree to an interview for whatever reason to get their message out. That's bypassed now in the way that mm -hmm. we are. I mean, you have terrorists. ISIS has one of the most sophisticated yeah. propaganda wings. Trump is on Twitter, and yes, I put them together in the same sentence. But uh, <laughs> do you think that, plus the decline in the news business in certain quarters, is changing the way? Do you think sure. she's kind of a lost? Sure, it lost is. Generation? And I think, and in some ways, I sometimes feel that you know Marie's death was the end of an era, and it was just before. Um, the kidnapping and killing of James Foley and Stephen yeah. Sotloff by Islamic State in, in Syria. And, you know, yes, I, 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 I do feel that. But I think that there's another thing phenomenon going on which is very positive, which is the rise in people telling their own stories. Yeah. So we, you know, it's too dangerous to get to certain places in Syria um, and Yemen. But there are journalists there who now because you know you can do stuff on iPhones and there are far more sort of bridge people who speak Arabic and English and all sorts yeah. of different languages who can tell their own stories and people say oh well you know are they biased and so on yeah well you know everybody's a bit biased and you have to evaluate things as you go along but one of the things um, that we've done sort of at least you said he'll be familiar to many of you who's also a very good friend of Marie's and other Marie's other friends of myself we've started a, a small um, uh, sort of charity in her name called the Marie Colvin Journalist Network, where we provide support to young female journalists in the Arab world. So these are, you know, these are women who are, are reporting. They're fantastic reporters, most of them. But often, you know, the editor in the newsroom may, you know, favor the men or say, oh, it's too dangerous for you to go there, or their families are against them doing this work. Or, you know, when it comes to the choice about who gets to go on the hostile environments course and who doesn't, well, you know, they'll pick the guys. Yeah. And so we try and support them through mentorship, through hostile environment course, through, uh, through counseling, all of these kind of things. And that, I think, is very positive because although, of course, I believe in foreign corresponding, I'm a foreign correspondent, I would. But in the end, I think that the stories people tell in their own societies and I think that the journalism which is done to bring your own government to account is the most important mm. thing. And there are Lebanese and Egyptian and Syrian and, you know, all over the Middle East. There are these young journalists and many of them are women who are trying to tell these stories and that it is such, I mean, Natalie was talking before about journalism and democracy. This is what democracy is about. And journalism is one of the key parts of it. And I think Marie understood that. And I hope that she would be happy that that is what we're doing in, in her name. I think she would be.